sit down and strap in because you're about to experience driving television. driving television. I'm Lacey Elliott. And I'm Zach Spencer. On today's show, Lacey and I kind of split up and drive different vehicles. I get a chance to drive a two-seater convertible mini roadster. The main competition for this car is the MX-5 Miata, one of Lacey's favorite cars. Well, I'm going to be driving something that's a little bit bigger, not so sporty, but definitely more practical and better for families, the all-new Ford Flex. Straight ahead on driving television. This is driving television with your hosts, Zach Spencer and Lacey Elliott. Also on today's show, it was a staple in the 60s, but can the all-new Dodge Dart capture market share 40 years later? Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Nissan. Innovation for all. We've been on record saying that the Ford Flex is the single best seven passenger people mover on the road. Yes, there are other vehicles out there that look more like a traditional SUV, but when it comes to roominess and functionality, this big box on wheels can't be beat. When we first reviewed the Flex, Zach and I were split on the design. I'm not a fan of the big boxy shape, but he loves the way it looks, kind of like a beach cruiser or something out of the 1960s in California. We're here with the 2013 model. Now the overall dimensions have stayed the same, but there have been some tweaks to the design. The name Flex is now proudly displayed on the hood, a tip of the hat to the concept vehicle Chip Foos did a few years ago. In fact, Ford used a few of his tricks, including the removal of the Ford oval and sticking with the prominent front grille bar. Then they narrowed the headlights and incorporated an LED look. Our test vehicle has the appearance package. It comes with 20 inch alloy and painted wheels, as well as some updates in the interior that I'll show you. The appearance package adds leather seats, upgraded door trim, and a classier overall look. If you're familiar with the previous Flex, you will immediately see the differences on the interior. The new dash now looks a lot more like the Edge and Explorer. The base sync system is still here, but the 8-inch My Ford Touch has been integrated and features the latest updates. Ford was nailed in recent quality studies because of the complexity of the My Ford Touch, and they rushed to update it. It's a bit simpler to use, but the touch points on the screen, one in each corner for navigation, heat, phone, etc., are still rather small and voice activation takes a while to master. Now, Zach was not a huge fan of the touch surfaces for the fan and other controls below the screen. We both think they look cool, but he doesn't find them as rewarding to touch and use as dials and buttons. I like it. I guess it just comes down to personal taste. Now what makes the Flex a must try is its huge amount of space. There's tons of room in the second row and the seats are very comfortable. They tumble forward for easy access into the third row and there's a lot of space back there too. And even with the third row of seats in the upright position, there's lots of cargo room for groceries and other items. Now, I also want to point out the decent sized cup holder and a very convenient location for the passengers in the second row. Ford also went to town with updates under the hood. The new base V6 engine has 20 more horsepower, bringing it to 285 from the upgraded 3.5 liter V6. The driver can also get the engine to perform just like they'd like, thanks to a six-speed shiftable automatic that Ford calls Select Shift. If you want to do the shifting yourself, though, you'll have to use the paddle shifters behind the wheel. Ford wants to provide their direct injection turbocharged engine that they called EcoBoost to 90% of their lineup by next year. Now the Ford Flex was one of the first vehicles to have that technology and thankfully it's still available. If you love the power and torque of a V8 engine, but you don't want to pay the high fuel prices, the EcoBoost motor provides V8-like torque at 350 foot-pounds and 355 horsepower. With this engine, the Flex can fly down the road and pass on the highway with ease, even when the vehicle is full. This would be our engine to order. 
The Flex shares platform similarities with the Edge and new Explorer, but the Flex is more car-like than the more ruggedly tuned Explorer. The boxiness of the design helps the driver to see each corner, and the big windows help too. The smooth ride and powerful engine make the Flex feel much more agile than it looks. This 2013 Flex looks a little bit more athletic and it's still very impressive with its roominess. Now you might want to try the new dash to see if you can live with the sophisticated electronics. The price starts at around $29,000, but if you want to get a fully loaded model like we have here, it'll cost you more than $55,000. Overall, the Ford Flex still can't be beat. That is, if you like the styling. Interested in an SUV? We have all the reviews of the latest models at drivingtelevision.com. Well, it's early morning here in Auburn Hills, Michigan. Auburn Hills, just a stone's throw from the worldwide headquarters of Chrysler. In a future episode, we're going to have a chance to go inside their design studio to find out how they made this car, the Dodge Dart. Based on an Alfa Romeo Giulietta platform, this vehicle has Italian roots. And because we're in Michigan, we've got the Dodge Dart. We're going to head up north, probably 230 plus miles, and then come back to a place called Traverse Cities, named one of the most beautiful spots in North America. And and it's also wine country in Michigan. It's our kind of tie-in bringing the American car back to its Italian roots with a little vino. Now we have to pack this car up with all of our gear. We've got two suitcases in there. We've got a couple of tripods and it gobbles it up nicely because this Dart competes on price in the compact class, but it's almost mid-size. Let's head out on the road. Driving in the Dodge Dart Rally, it has the 1.4 liter turbocharged engine, it's an optional engine, 160 horsepower, the same engine that's used in the Fiat Abarth. And we're cruising along at 70 miles an hour, that's the speed limit here in Michigan, and we've got the cruise control on, and we've just passed 40 miles to the gallon on the trip computer here. That works out to 5.8 liters per 100 kilometers, that's impressive mileage. Now we're not even halfway through our road trip, we'll let you know how we do when we get closer. Well, we've been on the road for a couple hours, time for a bathroom break to get a refreshment behind the wheel of the Dodge Dart on the way up to Traverse City. And we're in a small town called Clare, Michigan. And uh, you know what? It's been a very nice ride because the suspension has this European tuning, has great feedback to the driver, but it's not jarring or bumpy in any way. The big freeways on the way up here, the beautiful roads in Michigan, three and four lanes wide, but a lot of the surfaces are covered in concrete with expansion joints, and that has not been a problem for this car at all. The other thing is uh, the Dart is available with the 8.4 inch, the big navigation Uconnect screen. It got us here to McDonald's in Clare, which is nice for a break, and it's going to continue to get us all the way up north towards wine country. Room hasn't been an issue either. As I mentioned off the top, this car has mid-sized dimensions on the inside, but for a compact price. So, so far so good. Let's keep heading up north. The Dart comes with a fully independent suspension and disc brakes on all four wheels, something that many competitors lack. The price is also attractive, starting at $15,995 for the base model. The rally model seen here starts at $19,495. The top models are the Limited and RT trim levels at just under 23. There's also three engines to choose from, the base 2 liter with 160 horsepower, then the turbo seen here also with 160 horsepower, and the 2.4 liter with 184 horsepower. Well, we finally delivered the Dart back to its Italian roots, surrounded in wine country in Old Mission Peninsula in Michigan, a beautiful part of the world, something we had never even heard of before. And this car has performed flawlessly. We've driven over 500 kilometers today, driving here, driving around the area, shooting, getting in and out of this car. It's taken us about the best part of a day, six or seven hours. And sitting behind the wheel of this car, the one thing I have to say, comfortable. If you're somebody that wants room and space in a compact price, you can get mid-sized dimensions in this Dodge Dart. The other thing is it drives on the highway so beautifully, great suspension, perfectly tuned, and you can just relax. It's smooth and quiet, but also very dynamic at the same time. So that's the first part of our drive with the Dart here in Michigan. Make sure you tune in to the next show when we take the Dodge Dart right downtown. We get a little gritty in downtown Detroit to taste a cultural phenomenon. 
Have you ever been the victim of a low tire and need to add air? Spending time guessing how much air to put in a tire can be confusing. First, you have to find the recommended pressure required and hope that the filling station air pump has a pressure gauge. There's a new driving innovation that takes care of the guesswork. Nissan has just introduced Easy Fill, a feature that detects a low tire thanks to the tire pressure monitoring system. Once you attach an air hose to the car, the four-way flashers come on. This lets you know that air is going into the tire. When the tire is full, the horn sounds. If you accidentally put too much air in, the flashers blink faster and the horn beeps three times. Once you let out enough air, the horn beeps again to tell you the correct pressure has been reached. This helps take the guesswork out of filling your tires. By piggybacking off the tire pressure monitoring system and having a predetermined tire pressure, the car always knows whether you have not enough or too much air. This driving innovation keeps your car safer, helps improve fuel economy, and will prolong the life of your tires. If you're in the market for a two-seater roadster and you don't want to splash out the big bucks for a premium brand, say $50,000 plus, there are only two cars on the market. The longtime favorite, of course, has been the Mazda MX-5 Miata, and now there's this mini roadster. There is nothing like driving with just two seats in a convertible. It's a very intimate experience, and now we have choices. The MX-5 starts at just over $29,000, and the Mini Cooper Roadster is roughly the same price. Now, what this Mini has over the MX-5 is options. For example, this is the Cooper S version, the more powerful model. It starts roughly around $33,000, and for anybody that likes driving dynamics and a little bit of power, this is the one to get. If you really want a lot of power, then the totally souped-out version is the John Cooper Works version, and that's almost forty dollars Last season, we had a chance to drive the Cooper S Coupe, basically the same car as this Roadster here, but with a fixed roof. Make sure to check out that review at drivingtelevision.com. So the roof is manual, and this is the way it operates. There's a little latch here to release it. You pull the roof up. You can do it from inside the car, but it's a little easier like this, and put it down. There's a rotary latch on the inside to connect it to the top of the windshield, and the opposite to reverse it. It goes down pretty quickly. The Mazda MX-5 can be ordered with a manual roof like this or a retractable hardtop. It's a fantastic option and adds little weight to the car. Now inside the Roadster, the dash is the same as all other Mini products, and I'm not a huge fan. There's a whole bunch of different things going on here, dials, switches, and all basically scattered through the interior. After a while, you do adapt, but it could be better. The one that's kind of cool when you get the Roadster is this sunshine dial. It tells you how long you've had the roof down. Be prepared to struggle with certain maneuvers like parallel parking due to visibility. The trunk has a surprising amount of space. This is one major selling feature of this car, a trunk that's actually usable. Now the base model Mini Cooper is a cute little car, but you know what, I've never really enjoyed driving it that much because the power is underwhelming. The model to get is this Cooper S. With a twin scroll turbocharged 1.6 liter engine, it has 181 horsepower compared to just 121 without the turbo. 60 more horsepower in such a small car makes a huge difference. Then there's also the sport button right here by the shifter. When you push that, it makes the throttle livelier and also opens up the baffles in the exhaust. So when you lift off the throttle, you get all these pops and burps and little backfires to make the car sound so much sportier. You get this in the coupe, but it's much more effective when you have the roof down. Now, speaking of noise, I found that the coupe had too much road noise coming from the rear cargo area and then reflecting off the back window. Now, because this Roadster has a totally separate trunk from the cabin, even though it's a convertible, it seems more pleasant to drive. Now this car handles so well, you sit so low to the ground, it comes with either 15-inch wheels on the base model, 16-inch wheels on the S, and this car has optional 17-inch wheels, and the power goes to the front wheels, and that's one area where I prefer the MX-5. 
A true Roadster has a front-engine rear-wheel drive layout, and there's no purer example of this than the Mazda MX-5 Miata. That car is so well-balanced, and being pushed rather than pulled through a corner is a truer sports car feel. Now, the MX-5 might have less power at 167 horsepower, but the car's also lighter, and it feels nimble. What this car has is more torque when you get the S model, because you've got that turbocharger working for you. What this car has going for it is freshness and attitude, where the MX-5 is seen as old. Plus, it also has the chick car stigma. This car might be saddled with that one day, too, which would be too bad. The reality is neither car should be. They're both fantastic cars to drive. Now here's some good news. If you're a single person or a couple, you don't need a back seat. This Roadster is slightly cheaper than the four-seater mini convertible. And you gotta hand it to BMW. They've done a great job of staying true to the original mini design, yet keeping it fresh and modern. This car is a perfect example of that. Only two choices if you want a Roadster under $30,000. I'm thrilled there's a new option for everybody to drive. Interested in a hot new car? We have all the reviews of the latest models at drivingtelevision.com. Is it possible to drive the green road and have a blast behind the wheel? Well, the latest generation of lightweight, high horsepower, four-cylinder cars is a great place to start. This Scion FRS is literally the hottest car on any dealer's lot. So hot, in fact, that they drive right out the other side as soon as they arrive. So how is this lightweight and better packaged car a more engaging vehicle to drive? First, the engineers used a boxer engine. This style of engine sits low in the car, helping to lower the car's center of gravity. Also, take note of the engine's position under the hood. The largest and heaviest part of the engine block is as far back towards the center of the car as possible to help deliver as close to a 50-50 weight distribution. This is also why the heavy car battery is placed just under the windshield instead of the front engine bay. Really things like a lightweight hood uh, versus a regular steel hood. Um, and, and ultimately, the, all of the components in this car were looked at one by one to take as much weight out and performance up, and uh, we've done a really good job with it. Inside, the same approach to weight reduction has been utilized. Any items have been stripped from the car that might take away from the task of driving. There's a very simple heating system, very simple radio, the cloth seats are lighter than leather, and there's no unnecessary items like power seats. Even the trunk has no cover on the inside lid. Once again, not a necessity. What I think was most important about this car was that it was built around the driver and even the inspiration and kind of the, the collaboration with Akio Toyota himself, being a certified race car driver, it was really important. He put his fingerprints all over this and was based on the driver's ability to drive. And it wasn't a lot of bells and whistles. It was about how do you build the best car, lightweight, great output, great MPG, and still give it that best driving dynamics. And we really believe we put that whole package together for the consumer and now it's up to the consumer to tell us. The sum total of this package is a 200 horsepower rear wheel drive car that weighs just 1,251 kilograms. If you want to shed even more weight, then the manual is 22 kilograms lighter than the automatic. The green road never looked so hot. Production vehicle for the driving television crew is provided by Nissan Canada. Zach, can you believe it? We've been on the air now for 10 seasons. Wow, I feel old. You know what? You can go back and watch every single segment we've ever done at drivingtelevision.com right back to show one and watch the progress and see how we age. Zach, speak for yourself because I have not aged a day. Keep believing that. All right, kicking off season 10, and we have traveled all over North America to bring you all the hottest, newest cars. Lacey, let's give everybody a recap. Coming up on season 10, we will be traveling to beautiful Santa Barbara, California to test drive the all new 2013 Honda Accord. It's got direct injection, continuously variable transmission, and it's lighter for better fuel economy. 
Nova Scotia, one of the most beautiful provinces in our country, and we got to go twice for two very different cars. The first one, the SL550 Mercedes. Roof down driving and beautiful sunshine over spectacular scenery. This car is aluminum and has a spectacular V8 engine, yet it is more efficient, plus it has an adjustable suspension for the perfect driving attitude. Then we went to the Cabot Trail on Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia, one of those bucket list rows that you want to drive, and the Malibu is a perfect companion no longer sold with a V6 engine, it comes with a turbo four-cylinder and a spectacular new two-and-a-half-liter four-cylinder motor. Now, speaking of another vehicle that will no longer be offered with a V6, we had the chance to test drive the all-new 2013 Hyundai Santa Fe in Ontario's beautiful cottage country. Now, that V6 is being replaced with a very powerful turbocharged four-cylinder. Now, Lacey, you're from Calgary, Alberta, cowboy town. Give me another cowboy town in the U.S. Nashville. Exactly. That's where we had a chance to drive the all-new Ram 1500. Their motto for this truck was go big or go home. And did they ever. Well, Zach, from cowboy country to wine country, we test drive the all-new Lexus ES down in Oregon. It's lighter, less expensive, and the big news is it's now available as a hybrid. Well, that's just the tip of the iceberg, Lacey. All the cars coming up in season 10, so make sure you stay tuned. Well, that's it for this show. We'll see you next time. Safe driving. Lacey Lee Elliott's clothing supplied by Public Myth. Zach Spencer's clothing provided by Throat Threads Apparel for these fine designers. Want more? Check out drivingtelevision.com for expanded reviews and more automotive stories.